and try to understand how and why they manipulate large-scale systems currently and what that will mean as we look forward. So my goal today is actually to come at the question of security from the angle of an adversarial approach, um, really thinking through those logics. Now let's start with the idea of socio-technical. You'll notice that I called this title a socio-technical approach to security and machine learning. And the reason is because the notion of socio-technical system is something that comes from the STS world to highlight how systems are both technical and social at the same time. Um, and this is really important when we think about the application of machine learning systems. So as everyone here knows, we rely heavily on data, um, but that data comes in all sorts of different ways because of a variety of social practices. So even something like you know, data we would get from an EKG system, um, it's about the heart, but all of the decisions about how that data were constructed, how to interpret that data come from logics uh, rooted in a social practice of medicine. So when we try to think about what socio-technical security looks like, part of it is trying to intersect and engage the idea of both the technical and really building um, a secure technical model, but also the ability of understanding where the social uh, features come in. So you know, our goal is to think about what is the social context in which these systems operate and where we see adversarial places. So there's a long history of actually studying um, socio-technical system and seeing that interplay within STS. And part of what SDS scholars will point out for you is that time immemorial, technical actors imagine the ideal scenario in which something can and should work. And they design for that ideal, and then they sit there going, shit, that's not how it played out, right? Because time immemorial, the actual people who are working with systems mess with them. And they mess with them in the lightest of ways, trying to use the system the way they want to, let alone, of course, some of the kinds of bias that get inserted into a system or some of the adversarial parts to this. And of course, the history of security is understanding that intersection between the designing of a secure uh, ideal system and the very reality of humans. Um, and humans still make a mess out of everything. So I was a teenager um, and I was part of, you know, this is sort of in a pre-web era, um, my friends and I had a lot of fun hacking into all sorts of different systems. Now, we, while I managed to develop some technical skills later, um, I was not particularly technically sophisticated at the time, because you didn't need to be. For example, when we broke into our um, school's administrative system, uh, we relied on the fact that the administrators would be even dumber than we were. In fact, the password that they used was password, right? And so we were able to break into a system and remove a tuba from the data set, which is always itself a fascinating history for me. Um, because this, we started to see all of these ways in which human practices, human laziness, human ideas make a system especially vulnerable. Anybody who lives in a world of passwords knows this. And so within a conversation of security research, we end up thinking about how to build the most ideal technical system and then how to really grapple with the fact that it's always the sort of small little interfaces between the social and the technical that can actually put us into deep vulnerability. Um, and especially when we're talking about what it means to access something, right? Access vulnerabilities are almost always where um, things sort of get painful at the point of human laziness. All right, so I wanted to lay that out there because I think it's common knowledge within this room, but I want to lay it out there then to give you sort of a twist. And there's going to be two things that I'm going to do in this talk. The first is I want to invite you to understand and see data, not just as a process of input into your models and into, into your systems, but it's something I'm going to argue is data infrastructure. And the second thing I'm going to do is describe one kind of exploit that I regularly watch, um, where you can start to see how people undermine things at scale uh, longer term. So I'm going to start with the notion of data infrastructure. And to get there, I want to talk a little bit about infrastructure, right? The funny thing about infrastructure is that that's usually what we think of when we think about physical instantiations, right? The, the idea of sewage pipes working, the idea of our electric grid working. Um, and one of the things about infrastructure is that uh, once it's built, people like to forget about it, particularly politicians, right? Because it's costly to maintain. And the average person only thinks about infrastructure once it breaks, right? And then you get to see how uh, important infrastructure is to a social context. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't countless people securing infrastructure on a, on a regular basis. In fact, if we look at the work of many militaries around the world, a lot of it is about securing physical infrastructure. 
Um, but at the same time, you know, what we think about in terms of vulnerabilities of bridges and, and electric grids become much more complex over time. So in large organizations that are over 20 years old, how many of you work with an organization that existed before 1990? So it's a smattering of you. Um, and now, how many of you have worked with an organization that existed before 1970? Right, the same smattering, which is interesting. Um, I will work on where that comes from. Are you here from the government? Is that where we're at? Um, so inside these larger organizations, anybody there will tell you with anxiety about legacy code. Right? Government agencies in particular know about the patchwork of technical systems that sort of emerged, especially things that were designed in the 70s or before, because it's a huge vulnerability. Now the difficulty with you know, that kind of legacy code, um, which is a different kind of technical infrastructure, <coughs> is that it emerges within a political context. And so most people like in a government agency are like, can we please just rewrite this whole thing? I beg you. And they try desperately to get the resources to do it, and they're like, no, 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 but we'll give you a little bit of money to fix this piece of it, right? And you get this beautiful patchwork of Frankenstein-like code um, that you know, sort of grows more and more bulbous and messy over time. We've seen that happen in almost, almost any large old organization. So rather than fully modernizing, we end up adding another layer over and over again. Now, that occurs within you know, technical. It also occurs within mechanical systems. Um, so I'm particularly delighted and disturbed by, um, by the details of the New York City subway system. Um, I, New, the New York Times has been doing these beautiful exposés to help the public realize that the um, system is built on technologies from the 19th century, not the 20th century, not the 21st century, the 19th century, which themselves have been patchworked over and over again. And even the ability to tell you when the subway is coming is based on sensors that they've added on top of things because they have, of course, no digitized system. Now, needless to say, when you think about something that is based on that kind of old-scale mechanics, um, th things that are based on legacy code, you see all sorts of vulnerabilities, right? And certainly from a city place, we think about that. So, now what do we want to think about AI? We're all really excited about all sorts of ways in which machine learning and the various adjacency technologies that are sort of under the hyped rubric of AI might open up all sorts of new possibilities. And these technologies are by and large new, and they're being put into applications without a lot of thinking through where are the maintenance problems going to be in 20 years, let alone where are the real vulnerabilities going to emerge because of how that's unfolded. And I want to argue that many of the vulnerabilities are going to sit at that data infrastructure layer, at the layer of data that is not just uh, what you're you know, interpreting coming in, but what your models are built on, and all of the places where that comes together. Now, fundamentally, infrastructure um, is important because critical systems depend on it. So, you know, all of us who are academics, we are like, yay, like I built a piece of data layer, and it's really awesome, and I built a model, and I can throw it all away and move on. But when those systems start to get integrated within decision-making processes, that's when they become um, data infrastructure. So we don't really think about it in terms of data infrastructure, and I'm arguing we need to, and that this gives us an angle through. And in order to get there, I want to talk with you about a piece of data infrastructure that actually has nothing to do with machine learning, because I want to show you where vulnerabilities can emerge. So let's talk about the census. Um, I'm going to speak from a US context, in part because the US has some of the most interesting and archaic versions <coughs> of doing this. Canada has thrown out its census um, and has been engaging in an administrative data process that's in itself fascinating and flawed. The US has its own weird incarnation of it. Every 10 years in the United States, we enumerate the entire population. That does not mean we statistically model the population. That means we count, right? As basic as basic comes when it comes to data collection. And this may sort of seem funny and, and, and real, except to realize that in the United States, it is the, the process of collecting the decennial census is the largest organized buildup for doing anything in the US except going to war. Because there will be 600,000 people hired to collect the data for the US census, right, in a matter of three months. And that is important as a piece of data infrastructure because it's the infrastructure layer in which the US democracy depends. So our entire practice of apportionment is dependent on that piece of data. Um, and so you think about, Data, census data is basically uh, you know, democracy's uh, data infrastructure. 
So now, over the last 220 years, since 1990, um, a lot of aspects of the American democracy have evolved. But what's really fascinating is how little of the data collection process around the census has evolved, right? Since 1790, there's been how many advances in statistics? And yet we still enumerate everybody individually. Although not quite. We actually enumerate based holes for some, for some very weird archaic reasons, which means that rather than counting individuals, we count households. And it gets messier and messier once you go into the details of this. Now, needless to say, the actual data that we collect is 10 questions. But those 10 questions are about as politically fraught as they come. Just the categories on race alone have been a mess since 1790, where there used to be a notion of savage and civilized Indians, right? So this is, has a long-standing history of, it's problematic, not just to say what is gonna occur in 2020. All right, so that's a sort of fascinating piece of data for which we do things. Now let's acknowledge that it has been messed with time immemorial. Right? And so people have tried to mess with the census for all sorts of reasons since 1790. In fact, arguably in the United States, you could say our constitution was a corruption of the data collection process because we argued that enslaved populations should count as only three-fifths of a person. So this was always recognized as part of a challenge. What I would argue is that the census, certainly in, in 2020, which is the next <coughs> count, faces five different kinds of important threats. The first is a legal threat. Political threat, technical threat, communications or disinfo threat, and socio-technical. Let's sort of untangle those. Right, since 1790, literally since the beginning, lawyers, lawyers have battled over um, how to conduct the census. Every detail about how this is done, who counts, who doesn't count, what is inf accurate information, what is not accurate information, it's been a whole mess. The same is true for the political nature of it. So my favorite is that um, a sitting president uh, now in the United States puts their political appointees to go be ambassadors to places like Canada. Um, but uh, it used to be that the president used to assign anybody who helped them during a campaign to actually be enumerators. But it was recognized as political and it took us to the 20th century for that to not become as political. So there's been all these efforts to navigate legal and political battles forever. Now, where things start to get interesting is a shift that's about to occur in the U.S. Census. So for the first time ever, we're going to have an internet self-response census. That means people can go to a website and fill out those 10 questions on a government site. Now, many of you can probably figure out places where this might go wrong. Um, so one of the things is how do we start to think about where the different liabilities are with such a model? First, there's obviously the technical threats, right? What are the ways in which we can do a distributed denial of service attack for that? How do we start to think about the penetration of the AWS you know, install of that? Where do things go wrong in a technical layer? I would argue that there's a tremendous number of people working very hard to try to imagine and deal with those threats. In fact, those are the most salient threats um, in that conversation. We can have conversations about government technology and how wonderful it is, but work with us. Those next two types of threats that I want you to hold on to, which are really the cornerstone of where I think this conversation should go. The first is a communications threat. Colloquially, we'll call this a disinformation threat. So what happens when people are given the wrong information in order to encourage them not to participate? Or when they're, when they're too afraid to fill out accurate information? Or when the public becomes too invested in distrusting the data infrastructure itself? Right? Data infrastructure can crumble because not just because whether or not it's, it's actually functionally broken, but whether it's perceived to be broken. And that's the power and danger of a disinformation threat. Um, and in, that, in the United States, if you think about a democratic project that depends on data infrastructure, that means the entire democratic process can start to weaken when you uh, weaken the actual data infrastructure, when you stop trusting the data in different forms. The second key is around socio-technical threats, right? So you don't need to penetrate a system to corrupt the data. In fact, we heard a talk on this earlier this morning, and we've seen a lot of different conversations in, through the posters. So obviously there's ways in which adversaries can inject fraudulent data or use phishing attacks to shift the data. What's fascinating is not just about using phishing to steal the data, which we normally think of as a technical attack, but one to just sinkhole the data, right? So just make it so the data disappears. Right, ways of, of creating may have our confusion. Now there are of course numerous actors who might be interested in poisoning um, such data. 
Um, and so while the Census Bureau itself is really focused on that, in fact, they have a whole division dedicated to fraud detection, one of the things that becomes a challenge when people start to recognize the importance of data infrastructure is that the adversaries skill up, right? And we are seeing more and more sophisticated adversaries. So how do we start then thinking about the new evolutions of the maturation of the field as a whole? Because fraud detection can go so far, but again, that's a cat and mouse game. Now, the census is a ridiculously simplistic data collection project. We're talking about counting people, not statistical models, not you know anything you know sophisticated. Like we're really talking about 18th century technology here, right? And so the level of attacks that we're facing for something as simple as counting people should make all of us a lot more nervous about what happens when we have more sophisticated data collection, more sophisticated modeling, and more sophisticated systems uh, up, the, up the channel, especially when we think about things that become dependent on it. Okay, so I wanna put that as a way of thinking about data infrastructure. I'm gonna pivot, because I wanna talk some about some of the adversaries and sort of how I watch them move. And we'll talk specifically about search engines. So, on November 5th, 2017, a man walked into a church in Texas and started shooting. In a matter of minutes, news organizations across the United States sent an alert. It was a Sunday afternoon, and we all got an alert saying that there was an active shooting in Sutherland Springs, Texas. Now, the only information that anybody had for a few number of hours was the name Sutherland Springs. So, what happened? Of course, people immediately turn that into their favorite search engine and be like, what is Sutherland Springs? Where is Sutherland Springs? What's happening? Any new information, et cetera. What did they find? Now, the funny thing is when I talked to my friends at Bing, they said that no one had ever searched for that term, Sutherland Springs, in their history of the record. Now, it's interesting to note that this town is, for all intents and purposes, non-existent, right? In fact, the only content that seemed to be at all associated with Sutherland Springs was automated content produced by sites like Zillow. There was literally nothing. They didn't even have paper, right? There was nothing you saw. So within white supremacist networks, um, a crowd had actually gathered online within a matter of 20 minutes in order to figure out how they could use this story as a moment to shape and drive a specific agenda. And so they started posting fabricated information on Reddit and Twitter. Why? Google reads in Reddit and Twitter during a breaking news story when they have no other available information, trying to figure out what's going on. Um, and they rely on heavily on it. So that's a really core target. They also work to um, uh, target journalists in order to scramble the story, right? So anybody who follows Google or Bing or any of these other services, news appears at the top. So the real game is to get journalists to cover something in a particular way. Um, and the best way to do that is to spend time on Twitter just contacting journalists and asking questions, which is what we tend to see. Rather quickly, a Newsweek reporter penned an article detailing how far-right media and various other extremist groups were coordinating to associate the shooter with Antifa. The article was posted on Newsweek's site with Antifa responsible for Sutherland Springs murders according to far-right media. Now, if you follow Google, you will understand why those that were challenged in this article celebrated this article, right? Because Google has a character limit on its headlines. For the next 36 hours, the primary result that occurred um, for anything related to the, the shootings was Antifa responsible for Sutherland Springs murders, right? Now what that is, is that's an exploitation of what we think of as a data void, right? And this is a term coined by Michael Golbieski at Bing, where he was really interested in how search engines rely on having high quality data in order to provide good quality search results uh, for anything that a user might make. And there are many searches for which search engines at this point do a pretty good job. There's a ton of data, and it's all an industry challenge of ranking. And of course, since the beginning of, uh, of Google's development, we've seen search engine optimization as a skill trying to shape what's in this. And of course, these organizations have gotten a lot more sophisticated at addressing SEO. But there are still areas where there is simply no or limited data. And those are really interesting because they become a very viable target for adversaries. And so let's talk about four different kinds of data voids that we tend to see um, amongst groups who are trying to mess with them. And I will refer to them as the breaking news, um, strategically produced terms, toxic queries, and left behind terms. So breaking news, the Sutherland Springs case is an example of this, right? There's no available information on when a story breaks, so that means people scramble to fill it in. And that's not just, of course, adversarial. 
Some people are filling it in just trying to provide information. That's called journalism. Um, there tend to be highly weighted. But during that moment of chaos, there's a lot of opportunity um, and openings. The second idea is uh, a notion of strategically produced terms. So this actually has some very interesting roots. I'm particularly interested in the history of a political operative named Frank Luntz. Um, so in the 90s, he mastered the ability to produce and disseminate political phrases. Um, you might recognize some of them. The death tax, the partial birth abortion, climate change. These were all his terms. What was interesting was how he did this work. So it was a process by which he had a, had a uh, breakfast meeting once a week, and everybody um, within his political universe would come and be told what the terms to emphasize to the press were that week. And so it created a drumbeat. Every week the press would pick up this term whenever they would interview people, whatever the term would be. You know, it was a very sophisticated process um, that worked really well in shaping the information landscape in a pre-internet era. So how then do we think about that same process emerging now? The term crisis actor was actually first developed in an online forum shortly following the Sandy Hook uh, massacre. The term clicked for a range of people with different agendas, um, including gun rights activists, anti-mainstream media actors, conspiracy theorists, a range of people associated with hate groups, um, and a wide variety of others. Um, the term was used to imply that anyone who appeared in the media who identified as a victim following a mass shooting in the United States was actually just a crisis actor. They were just an actor. They couldn't possibly have experienced that because there was no way that the massacre actually occurred. Um, and during the Obama administration, the idea was that this was associated with the deep state or with the anti-gun lobby. Um, and the term was, during that period, summarily dismissed by journalists. But that didn't stop folks from really drumbeating that term. And in fact, shooting after shooting, um, those who wanted to propel Crisis Actor into the mainstream media used various soft puppet accounts on Twitter in order to ask journalists if a particular person was a crisis actor. They just normalized the term. Um, they put the term across all sorts of major environments. It was all over Wikipedia saying whether or not somebody was or wasn't a crisis actor. Um, people associated with far-right media, or sorry, movements um, and conspiracy theorist agendas talked about crisis actors on podcasts often to say that were, they weren't possibly crisis actors in order to flip it. But the chaos of uncertainty is what propelled the term into the mainstream. So it sort of hits this peak where after the Parkland school shooting, um, they managed to get major media outlets to start using the term um, in order to negate it. So Anderson Cooper of CNN asked David Hogg if he was a crisis actor um, in order to laugh off the term. But of course, that normalizes the term, and that's where you get a boomerang effect, right? Because people want to understand what this term is about. And they turn that term back into a search environment. But the thing about it is that search had been set up long before in order to make certain that when people search for that term, they reach specific sites that were designed to get there. So in other words, they pre-made the data environment in order to then take a term and propel the term. And of course, what they encountered um, was very conspiratorial in nature. Um, and that traffic was very effective. Now, this is not the only term. In fact, there's a lot of different terms that we've watched propel. Um, and some of them have um, pretty dire consequences. So I want to um, show that through the story of Dylan Roof. Um, Dylan Roof was a white man who walked into an African-American church and spent an hour at a Bible study before opening fire and killing nine. Um, and in his manifesto, he described how he was radicalized um, to embrace white supremacy. Um, and he's very explicit that he wanted to start a race war. Um, and he described in detail how he didn't understand what Trayvon Martin was about. He went to Wikipedia. He encountered the phrase black on white crime in Wikipedia, which of course was strategically placed there. Um, and then when he searched for that term on Google, he found the Council on Conservative Citizens, the white supremacy site, and he spent a long period of time going deeper and deeper. In fact, he spent two years becoming more and more involved in extremist communities before uh, opening fire. So, this is also where um, we start to look at you know, other kinds of frames. So like the third uh, version of this is how do we start to see frames that um, we have to wonder where they began in the first place. So a surprising number of people ask things about whether or not the Holocaust exists, right? And what results do they get? Um, a couple of years ago, if you did this on Google or Bing, you would get um, some, you get full throttle Holocaust denial. Today, organizations like Southern Poverty Law Center and the Anti-Defamation League have started producing content to try to combat that. Um, uh, YouTube has not been nearly as successful. 
Um, but there are many different phrases that um, already start from a negative and toxic place. That if you put that into a search, you will find stuff that is particularly devastating. Um, and so there's an interesting moment of like, how do you deal with a constantly moving environment? And what the difficulty is, is that people don't want to produce content to counter it, right? They don't want to produce content that is you know, uh, using these, these horrible terms. So by purposefully uh, normalizing terms that are polarizing, they're also a way of doing a different form of toxicity. So one of the things that I've been fascinated by is um, a bifurcation of language in the United States. So uh, for those who are um, fortunate enough to not have to watch US politics on a regular basis, um, the US happens to be extremely divided right now. Um, and that division is one that I would argue is an epistemological division. So it's literally how we know things is different. And how we know things being different is also where we get to see a universe that's different within search. So if you are primarily consuming content um, through, say, Fox News, CNN, uh, various extremist environments, you end up with very different venues into um, the search landscape. So some terms are easiest to see that are just like a classic split. So in the United States, if you switch or you search for terms related to illegals versus searching for terms related to undocumented, you end up with two absolutely different paths down search. Right? And that ability to use that linguistic divisiveness and to realize how an, a search engine actually works is a way of actually taking that material and, and pushing it through. So that's a way of segmenting based on um, uh, the epistemological differences. So the fourth uh, uh, and final um, kind of data void that I'm um, thinking about um, is ones that are actually about left behind terms. So these are terms that used to once be used regularly and no longer are for any number of reasons, right? There are words that become antiquated over time. Think about biblical phrases that are no longer part of contemporary lexicon. But there are shifts that actually happen at much quicker rates as well. So for example, um, on a political dimension, if you go to YouTube and search for social justice, the, what you will get as results are not the same as what you would expect if you were searching based on the logic of what that term meant from the 1950s to the 2000s in the United States. Um, in fact, that term has been very much appropriated um, and taken away from an idea of justice um, to one that is actually towards a very specific political agenda and usually, usually used as a pejorative. Um, and part of the reason why is because movements that used to talk about social justice now talk about things like racial justice. Um, but the challenge is that for search engines, particularly something like YouTube, they rely heavily on things being relatively new. And so if there's no new content using a particular phrase, it's very easy for those terms to be taken over. So when you watch adversaries move, they're trying to reverse engineer the system, and they're trying to figure out what are the layers of data upon which these systems operate. Because they recognize that they can't, or they shouldn't go in and try to alter the models themselves, but that they can do a lot by shaping the kinds of information landscape that are there, the data infrastructure, if you will. Now, the data infrastructure upon which search engines are built is fallible in many ways, right? This is just an example of it, right? Data voids are, are what I think of as a socio-technical vulnerability because they require a form of creativity at the social layer and a sophisticated understanding of the technical um, components. And of course, it's a form of iteration. It is fundamentally an iteration of search engine optimization, right? Which, of course, emerged for financial and marketing related reasons, uh, although it became political pretty quickly. Uh, but of course, this is not the only place where we see uh, vulnerabilities within data. We also see, of course, ways in which data can be biased, and those biases reemerge um, uh, in countless ways. Of course, perhaps this is best exemplified by the, um, the work of Latanya Sweeney. So Latanya is a computer scientist. She was um, from Harvard. She was sitting next to a journalist. Uh, she wanted to show him a paper she had written. And so she did an ego search for her own name on Google to get her paper. Um, I'm sure none of you have ever done anything like this. Um, and she, of course, was looking for the paper, so she was ignoring everything else. The journalist uh, sort of was looking over her shoulder and saw an ad that popped up and stopped her and said, why was Google giving her ads um, for a background check asking whether or not she had had a criminal record? And she was like, huh, what? Um, and so she realized that there was a, a company, a product, um, that was doing background checks that when she'd searched for her name was suggesting that um, Latanya had been previously arrested. She was like, that's fascinating. 
So she decided to sort of build a script and she pulled down baby names that had um, strong racial correlations um, through them at Google um, to see what kind of ads would pop up. Sure enough, this particular company um, seemed to have six variants of their background check ads and they clearly purchased that to, to be dependent on anything was related to a name. Now it's really important to note that Google does not allow people to purchase based on the racial features of those names. Um, it simply allowed them to purchase on name. And so why was she seeing this dynamic? What she was seeing was, was dependent, of course, on um, sort of an interaction component, which is that the American public, um, which this is a US context, the American public is extremely racist. So when they were searching for names that had historically been more correlated with um, uh, black and African Americans, they were more likely to click on the ad that was related to criminal justice. Um, and as a result, you know, Google had basically, basically learned Americans' racism and thrown it right back at us um, and sort of pumped it back at scale. And this is important because it's the way in which the bias emerges because of the fallibility of the public as they're interacting with the system. Right? The system was not designed to be fundamentally racist. The American public is racist, and that socio-technical collision is where we see um, a form of vulnerability. Now, cases of bias animate uh, many conversations around ethics and machine learning, um, uh, in part because pretty much every engineer you've ever met that works on one of these systems desperately wants the system to be neutral and fair, right? They really want it to just work generally for everyone, and they're constantly trying to make it more neutral and fair. Of course, this is why we're seeing a subfield of machine learning popping up dedicated to fairness, accountability, um, and transparency. And of course, with a world of bias, we assume that everybody is well-intended and really willing to work to correct the problem given limitations. But data voids offer a very different take on that kind of challenge, right? Because they show a different kind of weakness. Media manipulators are not well-intended. They may be politically or ideologically motivated. They may be economically motivated. They may have state-sponsored ideas, um, but fundamentally they're exploiting vulnerabilities both in technology and society. They're trying to trick people into responding in ways that benefit them or their particular agendas, and they're revealing how these systems are actually not designed for adversarial thinking. Even as we're seeing people try to get better about um, uh, refuting certain kinds of moves, we're not seeing them um, sort of go further into these kinds of adversaries. It's one of the reasons that like, it gives me no amount of pleasure to listen to all of you talking about different kinds of adversaries that you see um, hitting your models. So, now we're at a thought on security, right? Security requires both technical and procedural advances and interventions. Um, and I am you know, excited to see how many of you are working to advance the technical knowledge that we all need to address key vulnerabilities in these systems. But one of the things that I keep noticing is that the procedural advances are not keeping up with the conversation that's starting to emerge in the technical work. Now in no small part, this is because until recently, most organizations are really just hoping that the problem will go away. Um, and if you've been reading the news lately, it's probably pretty clear that it's not gonna go away anytime soon. So we've gotta actually start thinking about some of the procedural uh, interventions that allow us to grapple with socio-technical vulnerabilities. And this is important in realizing the history and the modernization of security as a whole. So you know, to get at this, I'm gonna sort of riff on two things that come from a security logic um, and say how I think they can be important going into a socio-technical space and into one thinking about security and machine learning. First, the conversation on data auditing, right? Now, auditing is a, has a really fascinating history, of course, coming out of financial interests, right? The idea that you have uh, fiduciary responsibility, the idea that board members um, are responsible for the financial structures. Um, as a result, uh, what we've seen happen over the last 150 years is forms of financial auditing that both try to account for um, problems that can be found in the data, but also try to threat model ways, ways, ways in which things can go wrong. And what I would say is that you know, that kind of auditing practice, which is a procedural practice, we've seen some versions of it in major corporations around security, right? Security audits. I'm sure many of you who are in big corporations have gone through them. But what's really fascinating is that security audits are really about um, understanding the particular tool with only the context of the company in mind meaning the focus is really heavily on where are the vulnerabilities at penetration, of where are the vulnerabilities of where the system could go down, et cetera. When we're talking about auditing systems from, uh, from a socio-technical perspective, 
we have to account for all of the variances of the data. If you're pulling data from Reddit on a regular basis, what are the different vulnerabilities in that data that will actually affect your system? Um, also, they need to think through all of the different possible paths of um, of what kind of you know, uh, data is thrown at it, so the search context, what search terms are thrown at it. And one of the difficulties there is that it starts to force you to think about where there are real weaknesses. So one of the things that I'm um, desperately trying to figure out is how do we identify every data void out there? What would that even look like? Um, and then what would it mean to respond, right? So if YouTube would acknowledge its data void and say, we don't have enough data, <laughs> go see Google. Um, I think we'd all probably better, be better off in certain areas. Um, as a second approach, um, I would argue for the idea of uh, building a white hat trolling program, which is what my colleague Matt Gertson has been uh, working on. So let's unpack that for a second. Um, back in the 1990s, the idea of white hat security and bug bounties was actually pretty non-existent. Um, it was actually in 1996 when um, an exploit into a Netscape browser prompted a PR person at Netscape to be like, please just don't do this. I will pay you anyway, just call me, right? Which was, I think, pretty funny. Um, uh, so in 1998, we saw a sort of interesting turn in this, um, uh, which is that a hacker group known as Cult of the Dead Cow uh, found a vulnerability in Microsoft's back office. Um, and tried to inform the company. The company being um, as arrogant as it was in 1998, told them to go away. Um, said that they didn't want to hear any aspect of this. Now, for those who don't remember back office, it was a piece of technology that was used in every major corporation and government. Um, and so, Call of the Dead Cow decided that they were going to shame Microsoft. Um, and at DEF CON that year, um, they launched a service known as Back Orifice that allowed anybody to walk up and penetrate any system in the, in the, um, that was using back office. Needless to say, Microsoft was not pleased. Um, so it forced a real reckoning on how to deal with security. These were the kinds of things that were happening at all sorts of different layers in the 90s. Um, and it started to see an evolution. Um, and that evolution is that um, within, you know, within the shift of the 2000s, we started to see the development of bug bounty programs. In fact, today we can't imagine a world without bug bounty programs. The idea of a white hat security infrastructure um, and the ability to think through how to engage those who might benefit you is also taken for granted. But it didn't come here accidentally. In fact, it was a long process. Back in the 90s, it was seen as a total sellout to possibly tell the companies in advance. Now we take it for granted. So how did we get here and can we do the same thing um, within media manipulation? Because I would argue that the actors that I watch, there are some who have extremely adversarial intentions, but many of them are like me trying to mess with um, uh, my high school system to remove the tuba, right? So many of them are much more just like, this is in it for the fun, I just wanna see what kind of craziness we can do. So are there ways of actually imagining a white hat trolling program? So, Fundamentally, what I hope this talk sort of offers um, is that there's a whole range of ways of thinking about the kinds of um, challenges that we uh, face at the intersection of security and machine learning. I am so grateful for the technical work you are doing. My team is really trying to think about some of the socio-technical places. And my hope is that as all of our work advances, that we can actually have more and more intersecting conversation. Because at the end of the day, if we're really going to protect uh, machine learning, and see the opportunity for these technologies to advance, it's gonna require a whole lot of interventions from technical to procedural and a bunch of ways of seeing about it. Thank you.